Good afternoon, everyone. Really appreciate your joining my wife and I today. Another beautiful day here. This afternoon, I'm going to try to fix the lawnmower. There's a part that came in. Get it fixed and go out and mow lawns today. So I love, actually enjoy and love mowing lawns. It gets me outside. Gets me some exercise walking behind the push mower. And also, it's just enjoyable riding a lawnmower. Still a little kid at heart. I'm glad you're here. I hope you're well. That you're basking in the love of Christ, even in the midst of this pandemic. That you know his profound peace that he can give. That the joy of the Lord is always ours. It's not our joy, but it's the joy of the Lord. He's always with us. He's always with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Oh, it's so good to be loved. Oh, it's so good to be at peace. Let's pray. Kind and gracious Father, I thank you for the beauty of the day, for grass growing green, for flowering trees, for birds on the wing, for sunshine streaming through the windows, through leaves growing brightly green, for blue sky, for Venus hung in the western sky, for the moon at night. But more than anything else, Lord, I thank you for your abiding presence, for the closer than your skin friendship of the Holy Spirit. Teach us to walk in the Spirit, to be led of the Spirit. And Father, help us to not grieve the Holy Spirit. We love you, Lord. We love you, Father. We love you, Jesus. And we love you, Holy Spirit. Father, I think about cities today all around our nation and around our world. Washington State is doing really quite well. And Father, as you know, there's going to be an announcement later from Jay Inslee, our governor, likely to extend our stay-at-home order. We don't know how long, but possibly for two weeks, but it looks like for another month till May 31st. We're all getting a bit of cabin fever, Lord. Give us the strength that we need. Give us the peace that we need to journey through this pandemic, to get through to the other side and not succumb to it, Lord. Today, nurses and doctors and medical technicians, x-ray technicians, pulmonologists, respiratory therapists, the orderlies, the janitors in the hospitals, all these people working on the front lines. I pray, first of all, that you would provide adequate equipment for them, the PPEs, the personal protectant protection protective equipment, gowns, masks, N95 masks, the face shields, everything they need to keep themselves safe as they care for people who are very sick, ventilators. And I pray that you would guard their health, Lord, that you would keep them from succumbing to the illness and certainly from dying from the illness, Lord. These days really, thing, really put things in perspective as to who the real heroes are. All those healthcare workers who are putting their own lives on the line by going to work every day. We applaud them, Lord. We shout out their, their names. 
we shout out our thanks to them. At the same time as I pray for doctors and nurses and all the skilled people in our hospitals, I also remember those who are serving overseas in the military, at bases and places all around the world, who are away from family, who are also facing the pandemic in the same way we are, yet without the support of community and family and home. We thank you for their service, Lord, knowing that sometimes it's a very, very difficult service. We pray that you would strengthen them, that you would guard them, that you would keep them, that you would empower them, that you would give them good success in everything they do and that you would preserve and protect their lives. And Father, I pray that you would deeply encourage them in their spirits, that you would lift their emotions, Lord, that you would give them a song to sing, that you would be the joy in their heart. We look forward to that homecoming. When they can finally return safely home. We pray for their families who are yet still at home in the U.S., wishing, wishing that their loved ones were with them, longing for that day of reconciliation. We pray that you would safeguard that day, Lord. Again, thank you for their service. Thank you for their sacrifice a sacrifice that goes beyond anything that we can know. Keep them safe, Lord. Keep your eye upon them at every moment. Lastly, I just pray that you'd give us great wisdom, our leaders, great wisdom in knowing when to reconvene, when to start up the economies, from everything I've been reading, if we start up too soon, it could be disastrous. If we start up too late, it can be disastrous to our economy, which already has been. Teach us what you want us to, to learn, Lord, through this. Not just we as Christians, but the whole world. But I would say, especially of us Christians, may we learn the lessons that you have for us through this pandemic what's important, what true church is, not a building or a time, but a group of people gathered who bear your name. I thank you for all these people you've given me to love, to feed. Your word to Peter, feed my sheep, tend my lambs, feed my sheep. So Father, I pray that by your spirit, good food will be served up today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for coming, for watching today, for listening, or for watching later on YouTube. This is Psalm 22, an incredible psalm. It was written by David. We know that he wrote it. And yet the subject of the psalm is nothing that David could have experienced in his own life. Nobody thinks that. And so David, acting as a prophet, by the Spirit, looked ahead into the future and saw the sufferings of the Christ, saw the sufferings of Jesus. And so the psalm is a prophetic psalm, a psalm that describes the crucifixion of our Lord, the torture of Jesus. So I'm going to read it through once, and then we'll return and work through it verse by verse for, for part of it. It's a pretty long psalm. It's 31 verses. Psalm 22, verses 1 through 31, reading from the New American Standard Bible, for the choir director upon Ageleth Hashashar, a psalm of David. My God, my God, 
Why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. O my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. Yet you are holy. O you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They wag their heads, saying, Commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, because he delights in him. Yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breasts. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me as a ravening, and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All of my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws, and you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil doers have encompassed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, be not far off. O you, my help, hasten to my assistance. Deliver my soul from the sword my only life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of the wild oxen. You answer me. I will tell of your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried out to him for help, he heard. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I shall pay my vows before those who fear him. The afflicted will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. All the prop prosperous of the earth will eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust will bow before him, even he who cannot keep his soul alive. Posterity will serve him. It will be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They will come and will declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has performed it. They will come and will declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has performed it. So we begin Psalm 22, verse 1, or actually the title 
It's, it says, for the choir director, upon Ageleth Hashashar, literally, which means the hind of the morning. There's all kinds of thought about what this means. It was likely that the title to a musical tune to which they would sing this psalm, a title to a song. But the hind of the morning conjures up two things. They would mix metaphors in Hebrew culture. In Hebrew culture. The hind was the hind parts of an animal. The strength of an animal was, its, was in its hind quarters. And so when, it was, when a person was being chased by an animal, that strength of the hind quarters was what gave that animal its pursuit. And so later on, he talks about the bulls of Bashan and so on that were encircling him. And so it's likely an allusion to what's coming in the psalm. But then it says the hind of the morning. So it's the power of, of the new day, the power of the sun as it crests, crests the horizon. And we get those first rays of the dawns of the morning. They call them the wings of the morning shooting across the sky. The power of a new day, the power of the brightness of light in our life coming in. Pictorially, it's a beautiful picture of the power that his mercies are new every morning, his compassions are new every day. And it's, again, attributed to David. So we begin in verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. These are incredible words because as we will see, much of this psalm is allu are allusions, prophetic allusions to what's going to take place in Jesus' life and in his death. So these words are found in Mark 15, 33 and 34. And I just wanted to point out, we're going to be looking at passages from Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, four different witnesses that were written independently of each other. Some were borrowing stuff from the other writers, probably Mark. But we have four witnesses that all attest to the same things happening. So this wasn't a group of men who, who got together and saw Psalm 22 and decided to fabricate a life for Jesus and then would actually give up their lives for a fabricated life. That makes absolutely no sense. These are four eyewitness accounts of what happened to Jesus that was prophesied a thousand years before through the life and through the voice of David, King David. So again, in Mark 15, 33 and 34, we read, When the sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. So this is when Jesus is hanging on the cross. For an inexplicable reason, darkness descended over the whole land. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out, which would have been about three in the afternoon. He cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as we've seen so many other times, when a New Testament author or Jesus uses a phrase from the Old Testament, quoting the Hebrew scriptures, He's not just bringing up that one line, but he's drawing our attention to the whole psalm. And this is the first words of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It may be that Jesus, having been a very good Jewish boy, had memorized these psalms, and now on the, hanging on the cross, he's quoting this psalm and begins by quoting the first verse out loud expressing that sentiment. Why would God have forsaken him? The, de the deduction we make about this is that on the cross, we're told in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, He who knew no sin, Jesus who knew no sin, became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness, the moral health of God. Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us. When Jesus became sin on the cross, the Father turns his head away. At least that's our thought. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus nailed cruelly to a cross. The most, most torturous 
and evil and painful death that they could devise. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We move on to verse 2. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I have no rest. Well, there's no direct allusion to this in, in the Gospels. And yet, as I thought about it and prayed about it, these verses came to mind from Luke chapter 22, verses 41 through 48. They've just had the last summer, right, the last supper right before the cross, right before their journey out to Gethsemane. And now they've traveled out to the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives, where Judas would come to betray him. And he takes Peter, James, and John apart with him and asks them to wait and pray while he goes off a little further into the garden to pray. And we pick up the story in verse 41. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but your, your will be done. Yet not my will, but yours be done. We know that this is at night. This is after their evening meal. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I have no rest. Now an angel, now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently. And his sweat became like drops of blood falling upon the ground. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I have no rest. When he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping from sorrow. And said to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not enter into temptation. They were so grieved at the prospect of Jesus losing his life, and maybe them too, that they just slept. While he was still speaking, behold, a crowd came. And the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was preceding them, and he approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Jesus had prayed, My God, may this cup be taken from me, if possible, yet not as I will, but yours be done. The answer he was looking for was having this cup taken from him, but Jesus knew that it would, wouldn't be taken from him. It was his human request. But there was no answer to that request. Psalm 22, verse 3, Yet you are holy, O you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Throughout the Hebrew Scriptures, we, we see the Hebrew people praising God. And we're told that he is enthroned, he's coronated, he reigns upon the praises of his people. I find great irony in these words now. In Matthew 26, verses 3 and 4, Matthew, the tax collector, who was called out of a life of cheating the Jewish people, a traitor to the Roman Empire, a traitor to the Jewish people who sold out to the Roman Empire. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people were gathered together in the court of the high priest. So you have the chief priests, they were the head priests in the temple, and the elders which is a word speaking of the Sanhedrin, the 70 rule, rulers of the ruling body in Israel, the Sanhedrin. They were a religious, a religio-political ruling body. So they had some authority over the people, a lot of authority over the people, under their taskmasters, the Roman government. And so it was the chief priests, the elders, and the high priest named Caiaphas that year. And these are the very men in that society who are supposedly leading the nation in the worship of God, in the worship of Yahweh, in the worship of his other name, Elohim. And when Yahweh shows up on the planet, when he touches down on the earth and walks amongst us, his sandals walking in the dust of this earth, 
these religious rulers who claim to be worshiping God don't even recognize him when he comes in the flesh. Yet you are holy, O you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. When Jesus came in on that Sunday, Palm Sunday, and everybody shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the, of the Lord. A week later, that enthronement, right? That the king coming riding in, victorious on his war horse. But only here, Jesus rides in on a colt of a donkey. Not quite the picture of what they were looking for. Was he enthroned upon their praises only to find out a week later those same crowds shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people were gathered together in the court of the high priest named Caiaphas, and they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. They plotted together to seize the Son of God, God in the flesh, by stealth and kill him. Then Psalm 22, verses 4 and 5. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. You think about A Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 sons, their journey into Egypt. And then 400 years and 430 years later, their incredible miraculous deliverance through the 10 plagues, their deliverance from Egypt, and even they're passing through the Red Sea, its waters being parted so they could pass through it on dry ground. And then all the times they fell away in the book of Judges, going after other gods, and God would hand them over to foreign oppressing nations. And then after that oppression, in the midst of that oppression, when they had lived in it for 20, 30 years, they would cry out to God, and he would send them a judge to deliver them from that foreign oppressor only to go through it again in the book of Judges is this constant cycle of the Israelites calling out to God. There were times when they called out to him, they trusted him, and he del delivered them. But it, in the end, what happened? They became so idolatrous after the fall of Solomon, his disobedience to God's command, which split the nation into two, they became so idolatrous that God had them carried off into exile. The northern kingdoms in 722, the northern kingdom of Israel in 722, the southern kingdom of Judah in 586. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. Here we find in Matthew 23 verses 37 through 39, Jesus loving, poignant call to the citizens of Jerusalem, to the Pharisees, to the scribes, to the high priests, to the elders, to the chief priests. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stone those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children, the way a hen gathers her ch chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. They're not wanting to trust in God. They're not seeking his deliverance in the way that he's going to deliver them. They want to be delivered from the Roman government and rise to their place of power and prestige and pride. That's not Jesus' plan at all. His plan is to take care once and for all their sin. Behold, your house has been left to you desolate. The temple was destroyed, 70 AD. For I say to you from now on, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. There's a day coming when Romans tells us that all of Israel will be saved. When the fulfillment of the Gentiles coming in has been reached, then Jesus will bring in the nation of Israel and will return them to the kindness of repentance. Psalm 22, 6, But I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men, and despised by the people. Calling yourself a worm is pretty low. It's not, e not even like a snake that crawls on the ground. A worm dwells underground in the mud, 
in the refuse, in the dung. I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. I think of the words of the crowds shouting out, crucify him. He was greatly despised by the people. Or in Isaiah 50, 53 verse 3, this is a, man, uh, a scripture that was a prophecy given by Isaiah sometime between, when was did Isaiah live? He lived, let's see. I have it right here. He lived from 760 to 673, from 760 to 673. So roughly 250 years to, two, to 300 years after the time of David. And he prophesies in Psalm 52 and Psalm 53, the suffering servant, the song of the suffering servant, this incredible prophecy, just like Psalm 22 of the death of Jesus. And in that prophecy, he, he says these words, he was despised and forsaken of, man, of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and, he, and we did not esteem him. In Psalm 22, verse 6, 250 to 300 years before, David speaks of the Christ, of the Messiah, of Jesus. He was a reproach of men and despised by the people. Isaiah says, and like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. And then Psalm 22, verses 7 and 8. And all who see me will sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They wag their head, saying, Commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, because he delights in him. They're making fun of him. They're taunting him. The one from whom all things, or the one through whom all things were created. The one in whom all things hold together. Who created these men, who knit them together while they were yet in their mother's womb. Who even now, as they spoke out their abuse, taunting Jesus, sneering at him, spitting on him, he's holding their very lives together. What love! What compassion, what restraint, what grace. I think of, again, Matthew 27, verses 38 through 44. This is a direct fulfillment of Psalm 22, verses 7 and 8. At that time, two rob robbers were crucified with him. The robber robbers were not just bandits, they were zealots. They were people who were set to overthrow the, over the Roman government. And it was for those kinds of people that the Roman government reserved crucifixion as a warning. They would put them on the public highways, leaving a city or coming into to a city. And after they died, sometimes they would leave them on the crosses for two to three days as a signpost. Don't rebel against the Roman government. At that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads. And saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, the chief priests were the leaders in the temple, doing the daily sacrifice, taking care of all the Animal sacrifices, the changing of the showbread, main, making sure that the menorah was kept lit, the, the candlestick there. The scribes, they were the lawyers of the day. They were the experts in knowing the law and understanding the law. They were formidable men. They knew the law inside and out. And the elders, again, the Sanhedrin, they were all gathered at the, at the cross, were mocking him and saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. Look at all these other people. He healed, he even, right, he rose or raised Lazarus from the dead, the little girl he raised from the dead. He healed countless people. Wherever he went, he healed people, but he can't save himself. What kind of Messiah is that who can't even save himself from the cross? He is a king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him. 
This is a loose translation now of 22, 7, and 8. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now. If he delights in him, for he said, I am the Son of God. Commit yourself to the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. Get the irony of what these chief priests and scribes and the elders, the members of the Sanhedrin are saying. They're saying he is the king of Israel in mockery when he really is the king of Israel. He is the king of the entire universe. He is Lord of Lords, majesty of majesties, king of kings. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe in him. Here's the irony. If Jesus came down from the cross, there would be no once and for all sacrifice. There would be no, no atonement, no covering from, for our sins. Our sins would remain unforgiven and we would all be destined to hell. Do not pass go. Do not collect 200. Go directly to jail. No, go directly to hell. And so there's this great irony that the very thing they're asking Jesus to do would be to stop the sacrifice that God is intending to carry, to cover, and to forgive these very men's lives and their sin and their evil. Can you get this? This is the seminary professors of the day. These are the pastors. These are the superintendents and bishops. This is the Pope of the day, the high priest. Wow. All turned against the very one they say they're worshiping. The robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. So we find in Matthew that both of the robbers began by insulting him and hurling abuse at him. Later on, we know that the one robber changed his mind, seeing Jesus and his actions on the cross. And so he turns to Jesus and says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus' most poignant words today you will be with me in paradise. What a prayer for us. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me, Jesus. Save me. We move on in the psalm. There's a transition now. He's now talking about his past, remembering God's care for him in the past. Yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breasts. We think we have this odd kind of theology about the birth of Jesus. We think that at the birth of Jesus, he knew that he was God from the moment he was born or even while he was yet in the womb. But in Philippians, it says that he emptied himself. So in his power, he was able to empty himself of the privileges and power of his deity and became a perfect human being and lived just as we did and just as we have, learning, growing, And so he had to come and trust when he was yet feeding on his mother's breasts. Yet God is the one who brought him forth from his mother's womb. Even though Jesus was coexistent and co-eternal with the Father, he put himself into the human race through the Virgin Mary. Verse 10, Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. As soon as I was born, my parents cast me upon you. They took Jesus to the temple on the eighth day, had him circumcised, which was keeping with the law so that he would be under that covenant of Moses. He was born under the law so that he might redeem those under the, from under the law and free them. And it goes in verse 11, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. His mother is of no help. We'll also find out that others were of no help. In Matthew 26, verses 55 and 56, we read, At that time, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me, as you would against a robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple, teaching you, and you did not seize me. Why didn't you come by daylight? I'm, I've been with you all the time. And now you're coming at night with, with a great crowd of, of soldiers and the 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 captain or the guard from the chief priests? What harm have I been to anyone? And you come with clubs and swords against me. But all this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures of the prophets. 
And then these very sad words. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Judas has already betrayed Jesus by a kiss. Peter is yet to deny him three times, even though he has declared, I will even die with you, Jesus. But the ten other disciples, they flee into the darkness. They flee into the night. And Jesus goes solitarily and solely to the cross by himself. There is none to help. Well, Simon Cyrene was there for a moment. But when Jesus gets to the cross, there is none to help. And God isn't going to help him. Because God and Jesus are together in on this to bring about the salvation, the redemption, the forgiveness of all of humankind for anyone who would call out to Jesus, I believe, save me. I believe, save me. And then we continue. We go into a new section again. And it's a section which recalls the suffering of the Messiah Many bowls have surrounded me. Strong bowls of Bashan have encircled me. Bowls were always an indication of the Canaanite god, the Baals. They worship the bull god. These strong bowls have, en have encircled me. What he's getting at is the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, the Sanhedrin, the crowds. They were all into idolatry. Not maybe the idolatry of worshiping the Baals, but they were worshiping the idolatry of their own religion, of their own strength, of their own ability, of their own ability to gain a righteous life by what they could do, by keeping the law. Many bowls have surrounded me. Strong bowls of Bashan, Bashan have encircled me. I think of these words in Matthew 27, verses 1 and 2. Now when morning came, all the chief priests... And the elders of the people, the Sanhedrin, conferred against Jesus to put him to death. To put the Messiah to death. To put the Son of God to death. To put Yahweh to death. To put the Christ to death. And they bound him. And led him away and delivered him to Pilate the governor. Many bowls have surrounded me. Strong bowls of Bashan have encircled me. And who are they? The chief priests, the elders, the scribes, the Pharisees. And they thought they were doing God's work. They thought they were stamping out this cultish figure, not realizing that he was Yahweh in the flesh. Verse 22, 13, they opened wide their mouth at me as a ravening and a roar ravening or rave, ravening and roar, roaring lion. They open wide their mouth at me. I'm reminded again of Matthew 27, verses 24 through 31. This is after Pilate has tried to release Jesus. He doesn't want to try Jesus. He knows he's innocent. And so he, he thought by giving the people a choice between Barabbas, this known, despicable, violent criminal, probably a murderer, Barabbas, and Jesus, who had been heralded as the coming king just a week before. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So Pilate figures, if I can give them a choice between this despicable criminal Barabbas, who was a zealot, who likely had been involved in the murderous overthrow of the Roman government, or to give them Jesus, the one who they who had healed their diseases, who had raised their dead, who had freed them of demonic oppression. He figured they would choose Jesus and he would get off the hook. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, he was afraid of the people, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd and said, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people said, His blood shall be on us and on our children. They just cursed themselves. Then he released Barabbas for them, but having Jesus scourged, he handed, handed him over to be crucified. They opened wide their mouth at me. His blood shall be on us and on our children. 
And then Pilate had Jesus scourged. That's being whipped with a cat of nine tails in which they would take nine leather, leather straps, tie in bits of bone and metal into it, and then they would strip the person almost naked and then flay their back buttocks and the back of their thighs 39 times. They called it the, the 40, 40 lashes, but they believed that 40 lashes would kill a person, so they would take 40 lashes minus one to preserve the person's life. Many people would die to it. It was such a torturous thing that it would lay people's entrails bare in their backs. It was a horrendous torture, a horrendous thing to undergo. And all it says is, but having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into to the praetorium. These would, would have been the Roman soldiers and gathered the whole Roman co cohort around him, a great group of Roman soldiers. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. This is the son of God. This is the Messiah. This is the one through whom all things were created. This is the one in whom all things hold together. And here these men are beating the crap out of him. They strip, stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! Hail, King of the Jews! Hail, King of the Jews! And I think, what restraint does Jesus have? This is the one who spoke through whom the entire creation was created by his word. He spoke creation into being. All for the love of humankind. Enduring this all for the love of you and I. Enduring this all for the love of our parents and our children and our brothers and our sisters and our wives and our husbands. They spat on him and took the reed and began to beat him on the head. It wasn't just the reed, it was a rod. After they mo had mocked him, they took the scarlet robe off of him and put his own garments back on him and led him away to crucify him. Hail, King of the Jews! They opened wide their mouth at me as a ravening or ravening, a ravening and roaring lion. Continuing in verse 14. I am poured out like water, and all of my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. Scientific, scientists have studied the crucifixion and what it would do to the body. And this is a perfect description of what happens to a person when crucified, hanging on the, on the cross so long with only the, all of the weight of your body hanging on that nail in your feet and in the hands. It would really, really be in the wrist right here. This would just pull out here, but they would put it between these bones and the wrist. That was considered part of your hand in Hebrew culture. As all that weight would bear down on you, it would take your bones and put them out of joint, and it would do a number on your heart. Because to breathe, you would have to push up on the nail in your feet, causing searing pain in your feet, enough so you could get a breath, only to sink down again, causing searing pain in your hands or in your wrists only to push up on the nail. It was a torturous thing. Crucifixion wasn't invented. It was invented by the Persians in about three to 400 BC. This psalm is written a thousand years before Christ, 600 years before crucifixion was invented. Psalm 22, verse 15, my strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. And you lay me in the dust of death. My strength is died, dried up like a potsherd. No strength left. My tongue cleaves to my jaws. They would get so thirsty on the cross. I'm reminded of the verses in John 28 through 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture said I am thirsty and my clunk tongue cleaves to my jaws a jar full of sour wine was standing there 
So they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished! We're told elsewhere that he cried out with a loud voice, It is finished! The Roman battle cry, meaning the battle is won. A word that also meant that the debt, our debt of sin has been paid in full. We've been purchased by the shed blood of Jesus. And now we've been set free. It is finished. The debt is paid in full. And it also meant the full requirements of the law have been fulfilled. The curse of the law, the just requirements of the punishment of the law have been now met in the body of Jesus. And so he tries, cries out this one word with three different meetings, meanings. It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The amazing thing about this is people have studied crucifixion and what it was to die on a cross. In the last hour or so, nobody could lift their head. Nobody could cry out with a loud voice. They almost entered into a comatose state. And yet, revealing to us that Jesus did not, he wasn't killed by the Roman soldiers, he wasn't killed by Caiaphas or the chief priests, but he laid down his life on his own initiative. No one takes his life from him. He lays down his life on his own initiative. That's in John 10. And he bowed up his head and gave up his spirit. And you lay me in the dust of death all for love of you, all that your sins might be forgiven, all that through, all so that through the resurrection you might be saved, all so that he can be yours forever and you can be his, so you can be in an eternal relationship and friendship with the God who loves you more than anything we can ever imagine, who would give up life all for want of you and me. All for love of you and me. Are you starting to get it? Are you starting to understand how much our God loves us? How much he loves this world, this pandemic hampered world, this pandemic sick world? Moving on, 22, 16 in Psalm 22. For dogs have surrounded me, a band of evil doers have encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. In the 10th century uh, BC, there was no indication of why that would ever happen to a person. Crucifixion had not been invented until between 400 and 300 BC, 700 years before. David prophesied, they have pierced my hands and my feet. We read these words in John chapter 20, verse 24 through 29. We're never told that they pierced his hands and his feet with nails directly. All that was said it doesn't glorify it, doesn't glorify his scourging, doesn't glorify his scourging, I mean his crucifixion. It just tells us he was scourged, and then it tells us he was crucified. But after the resurrection, we're told what that meant. John chapter 20, verses 20. 4 through 29, but Thomas, one of the 12 called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. I love Thomas. So the other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands, the imprint of the nails, ah, the imprint of the nails in his hands, and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side where he had been driven through, the spear had been driven through his body to ensure that he was dead. I will not believe. For Thomas, it was seeing as believing. After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, he came right through the wall. I'm sure they uh, jumped, maybe hitting their heads on the ceiling. I've never seen a man come into the room through a wall. That would have freaked me out. And stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Those are perfect words. Thank you. Peace be with us. You're not here to destroy us. 
we who ran into the night, we who denied you. Then he said to Thomas, reach here with your fingers. He's going to meet Thomas right where he was at, at his very request. Reach here with your finger and see my hands. And reach here your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. And I gather that Thomas really did touch those nail imprints and the scar or the wound in Jesus' side. And all the other disciples too. In 1 John, we get those opening words of John, that which we have seen, that which we have heard, that which we have touched. We proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and which was manifested to us. We touched him. And I'm sure that being the eyewitnesses of the cross, that they had touched the wounds of Jesus. Continuing, Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, because you have seen me, have you believed? Seeing is believing, Thomas. Blessed are they who do not see, who did not see, and yet believed. That means we're really blessed, because I've never seen Jesus, only with the eyes of faith. And so in the mystery of the kingdom, believing is seeing. Believing gives us an incredible insight. And even believing is his gift, is his persuasion, is his teaching us. We move on in Psalm 22, verse, to verse 17. I can count all my bones. They look at me. They stare at me. I think again of that prophecy of the suffering servant, of the song of the suffering servant in Isaiah 52 and, and Isaiah 53. Just as many people were astonished at you, my people, astonished at the Israelites, so his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Think about what happened to Jesus. When he was with Caiaphas, they slapped him, they beat him with rods on the face, so that his face would have been all mottled because of the, the rod hitting his face. When he was brought before this, the uh, Pilate in the cohort, they scourged him 39 times so his back would have been filleted. They beat him with a reed. They taunted him. They put a crown of sharp thorns on his head, which have caused blood to trickle down his face. And then they crucified him. So his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of man. All people could do was in shock stare at him. Or again from Luke 23, verse 35, and the people stood by looking on, staring on. And even the rulers were sneering at him saying, he saved others, let him save himself. If this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. And again, they're asking him to do the very thing he can't because he's about saving them too if they would but turn to him. And we know later on after the resurrection that many of the Pharisees and other leaders in Jerusalem came to believe in him. They divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. Again, directly, a direct prophecy of what happens to Jesus. In Mark 15, 24, and they crucified him and divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide what each man should take. So that's the short version. Mark has the short version. John has the long version. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, a part to every soldier and also the tunic. Now the tunic was se seamless, woven in one piece. So his outer, outer gar garments, they divided up into four pieces. Why would they divide up cloth? Because cloth was very valuable. They didn't have the kind of technology we have, have that can just produce cloth so easily. Cloth was a very valuable commodity. They would have taken that home. Probably their wives or sisters or daughters would sew it into a new garment. And yet his tunic, his undergarment, was just one piece. There was no seam in it. Whoever had woven this was a master weaver. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments and among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. 
And here in Psalm 22, 18, that prophecy a thousand years before the event, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Think about how many prophecies we've seen in this scripture foretelling the crucifixion and torture of Jesus. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God who takes away your sin and my sin. And then we get another transition again into asking for care, care from the Lord. In the earlier section when we saw him remembering his mother, it was remembering the care that he had received in the past. Now he's asking for the care now. But you, O Lord, be not far off. O you, my help, hasten to my assistance. Deliver me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my only life from the power of the dog. That was a horrible slur against people to call them a dog in Israelite culture. There could be nothing lower than a dog. Save me from the lion's mouth. From the horns of the wild oxen, you answer me. And then it continues, and we get another translation, and this is into the psalmist witness. And now it's not just Jesus, but it becomes us too, as people who are indwelt by the power of God, who are indwelt by the very presence of Jesus, who are filled with the Holy Spirit. I will tell of your name to my brethren and to the sisters. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. Speaking of the congregation of Israel, but here it's the congregation of the church. You who fear the Lord, praise him. You who have that reverential, awestruck fear of what God did in and through Jesus on the cross, you praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you descendants of Israel. We are descendants of Israel through the faith of Abraham. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Have you been afflicted in your life? Have you had affliction in your life? He has not turned away from it. He has not despised it. He has not abhorred it. Nor has he hidden his face from us or from Jesus. When he cried to him for help, he heard. When Jesus cried to God for help, he heard. God's face wasn't hidden from Jesus on the cross. It felt like it. He did not despise nor abhor the affliction of the afflicted. Everyone's face turned away or staring in unbelief. But the purpose of God and the purpose of Jesus being one they carried it out to the bitter end. For you come, for from you comes my praise in the great assembly. I shall pay my vows for those who fear him. Jesus paid all of his vows that he would do this thing of offering up his life, the sacrificial lamb that takes away the sin of the world. We're told not to make oaths. Yet in Matthew, Jesus says, Let your yes be yes and your no, no. That's it. Don't make oaths. Don't make promises that you can't keep. Verse 26, the afflicted will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. Those, the afflicted will eat and be satisfied. There will come a day when there's justice for the afflicted. Those who seek him, those who seek Jesus, will praise the Lord, will praise Yahweh, will praise Jesus. Let your heart live forever. Let your heart live forever by seeking Jesus and praising Yahweh. We're getting at the movement of believing in him so that we may live forever. Verse 27, And all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will worship before you. This day hasn't come yet. I'm not sure how it will come, depending on your prophetic view. In the covenant, we agree to disagree. So we accept people with all five views, including partial preterism, full preterism. We won't go into that, but there's five major views, the prophecy, uh, dispensationalism, 
historic premillennialism, all millennialism, postmillennialism, and partial preterism. All fancy words to say we really don't know exactly. Some people will vehemently argue their case. Jesus told us we wouldn't know either the time nor the seasons. We wouldn't know the chronology of the event, that's the word, nor the opportune time, the season of the event. Instead, be about being a witness to the world. And get this, all the ends of the earth will, will remember and turn to the Lord. They will remember what Jesus did for them on the cross, this incredible sacrifice he met, made, and all the families of the nations will worship you. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. For, for the kingdom is the Lord's. For the kingdom is Yahweh's. And we know that Jesus coming upon the scene said, I am. He is the Lord. He is Yahweh. And he rules over the nations. Through the cross, he re regained, if I could say, dominion over this earth. All the prosperous of the earth will eat and worship. And all those who go down to the dust will bow before him. Going down to the dust meant those who are dying, who, who have died, will bow before him. All those who go down to the dust. Everyone who has ever lived will end up bowing before King Jesus. Whether as one accepted through faith or one who has been forced to bow. Even he who cannot keep his soul alive. I can't keep my soul alive in of myself. I don't have the ability to have life in myself, but I know the one who does. Prosperity will serve him. It will be told of the Lord to the coming generation. So the story will be told over and over again. The story of the crucifixion, the story of what Jesus did, what he accomplished on the cross. It will be told of the Lord to the coming generation and to the coming generation and to the coming generation. And in our last verse, they will come and will declare his righteousness. Get this, they will come and declare not our righteousness, but his righteousness, what he did for us in, on the cross. We have obtained a righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, not based on the works of the law, but comes as a gift entirely from God. A whole life, a life put back together again, a life in right relationship with the Father, and a hallowed and holy life. They will come and will declare his righteousness to a people who will be born. And the connotation is to a people who will yet be born, that he has performed it, that he has performed the sacrifice of sacrifices, that he has declared it is finished, that he has taken care of the sin of the world, that he has delivered us, that he has redeemed us, that he has saved us, that he has justified us, that he has set our feet on high places that he has set our feet on the rock of Jesus Christ. He has performed it. He has done it. He succeeded. He beat death. He beat Satan. He beat our sin. And he now offers us that gift of life, but for the believing. It's so simple. Not easy, but simple. The most direct place I can find it is John 6, 47. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes, she who believes, has eternal life. You believe in Jesus, that he's the one through whom all things were created, that he's the Messiah, the one who came to take our sin upon himself. If you believe that, there's lots of other things to believe growing from there. But if you believe that, you're given the gift of eternal life. Say, yes, Lord. Save me, Jesus. I believe is he persuading you now? I can't. But the Holy Spirit can persuade you. And that's my prayer for you, is that the Holy Spirit will per persuade you that everything we've seen today in his word is true. This amazing prophecy, a thousand years before the time of Christ, and even those words in Isaiah, 700 years before Christ, speaking of the same event of Jesus giving his life on the cross, that you might live, that you might be forgiven, that you might be saved, that you might be given eternal life.
Well, thank you for joining me. I went a little long today. It's a long psalm and there's so much in it. But time doesn't matter. We're all sitting at home anyway, right? Except for those of you who are, who are serving either in the army or navy or and those who still are working. Thank you for joining me today. Let's close in prayer. Father, I just want to thank you for this amazing text. This prophecy given by King David that had no correspondence in his own life or in his own culture. None of these things were even known about in his, his time. Yet a thousand years later, they make clear and perfect sense. We know that it's true. Not just one part of this is fulfilled in prophecy, but point after point after point fulfilled in the, in the life and death of Jesus. Father, thank you for giving us insight. I pray for everyone watching now and for those who will be watching and listening later that you would give us all illumined eyes, illumined hearts, that we would see your glory, that we would see your great love for us, that we would see what you have done for us, that we would know the peace that you have brought us into, that we would know the joy of the Lord, and that we would know an eternal hope. That This life is not all that there is. There's no place like home. You've called us to a home to which we've never been yet a home which is our true home and a home for which we long. I pray for everyone watching that you would bless our lives. You've already blessed us with every spiritual blessing. But I pray for strength and for hope and for deep encouragement and for the knowledge of your love, Lord. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for joining me today. We'll be back on Sunday at 11 a.m. I'm not sure which text I'm going to use, if I'm going to continue in 2 Corinthians, likely 2 Corinthians, but I've also been doing a Communion Sunday sermon series on Isaiah 52 and 53. So I may very well go back to that and continue that Communion Sunday to break up a little bit of the monotony of being in one, one text over and over again. So if you want to join us, please bring bread and a beverage, doesn't matter what it is. Last time I had cherry Coke, my family have had body armor, mango peach body armor, and we just had uh, pieces of bread. It can be a cracker, Ritz cracker, Ritz bits, whatever it is, rice, pardon? Donut, some people had a big tray of donuts. I envied that communion, wow. And in the covenant, we believe that everyone, that communion is open to everyone who has entrusted their life to Christ who has believed, who has been born of his spirit. We believe that the true body of Christ is made up of every believer, regardless of what denomination or what church they're in, as long as they have believed in the authentic Messiah, the authentic message of the gospel, the gospel of grace. Come and join us. Remembering the Lord's sacrifice, remembering the very thing that we looked at today. So hopefully I'll see you at 11 a.m. on Sunday. I hopefully will have the links up a little earlier. So let's close with a benediction. This is found in 2 Corinthians 9.8, reading for the New International Version. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things and at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And God is able to make all grace, all grace abound to you. Amen.